Well, good morning, Strathmore Alliance Church online. Uh, as much as I love to open the Word of God with you together, uh, I know that we're not doing that in person, but I want to do that this morning with you. And I truly do miss gathering in person, worshiping together, and I long for that day and pray for that day that we will know and live and proclaim the truth and love of Jesus Christ together again. But even before that day happens, we need to acknowledge that our hope extends far beyond this world going back to normal. And we need to realize that there will come a day when God in Christ will come again, and in a twinkling of an eye, we will be transformed and receive all that we have hoped for in Christ and through Christ and by Christ. And so until that day, even in days like this, I pray that he will find us awake and alert and active in the calling that he's given to us to, make, to go and make disciples of all nations. If you've joined us here today and you've never kind of watched this before or know much about Strathmore Alliance Church, I'm Pastor Mike Weeb, and it's a pleasure to have you join us this morning. And if you want to find out a little bit more about us, you can always go on YouTube, on our channel, and look at past messages, and also visit our website at strathmorealliance.com. And if some of you here today are looking for a home church in the Strathmore area, or uh, perhaps you have questions about God or anything like that, uh, I welcome you to even just send me an email or contact me in some way so that I can help in whatever way that I can. Well, as we open our books or our Bibles to the book of Jonah, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can gather together, even in our homes today, and we can look at it. It doesn't recite a mysterious monologue, but it actually gives the story of Jonah's own experience to captivating storytellers. Now, the very first verse says this. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, just like it did with all the other prophets. But right after that, in verse 2, we don't hear them, uh, Jonah, telling the message that God gave him. In fact, we hear that Jonah is not called to just preach a message, but to become a missionary and preach. It says in verse 2, Arise, go to that great and wicked city of Nineveh, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so by the third verse already, we see that Jonah is not just going to tell, uh, just say out loud what God is giving him, that word. He's actually going to have to go. But the third verse tells us that he doesn't go. He runs away from God. And so what we see him trying to do is this preposterous pushback of actually trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And the author through this book traces Jonah's steps. First, we see that he goes down to the port city in Philistine, uh, the port city of Joppa. And there, which is a maritime uh, import-export hub in the ancient world. And there he finds a ship going as far away from Israel and even farther away from Nineveh as possible that he can get. And then he boards the ship after paying for a ticket, and he thinks he's off into the sunset. Now, surely Jonah knows Psalm 139, which talks about the omnipresence of God. It says, it says surely if he takes the wings of the morning and dwells in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there God is present is sovereign, and he knows everything that is taking place in his world. This psalm focuses 
focuses on the astounding reality that God knows everything that everyone is doing and that he looks at our hearts and knows why we are doing it as well. And so as Jonah sets off into the Mediterranean Sea, Jonah's expect, uh, expectation isn't to go where God is not. He knows he can't go somewhere where God is not. But his expectation or his hope is that he will get so far from Israel and even farther away from Nineveh that God might actually change his mind. God might actually abort the mission or he'll just find someone else to do it. Now, the book of Jonah then contains a really interesting concept for all of us to consider, and it's this. We noted it last week at the outset that, that God has given Jonah a clear command, and Jonah has given God a rebellious response. And what we find here is, the, is answering the question, what does God do when we obviously rebel against what he wants us to do? This is what this book is going to challenge us with. We see that Jonah is a man who refuses to obey God. He represents a nation that is generally refused to obey God. And this also, he represents the church, which also refuses to obey God at times in various ways. And so through story, we are going to be challenged how it is that the author wants to ask us, how are you disobeying the word of the Lord? And before we think that, well, I'm not a prophet like Jonah, I don't receive the word of the Lord like Jonah. What we do have before us is the word of the Lord. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us, it reminds us that every word, all scripture, is from the very mouth of God. So with the word of God before us, the question is, what are we refusing to obey in God's word? Now, I know that's a, a broad question because the Bible is so big. There are so many different commands that we could say, well, I'm not doing that or I'm not doing this. And so what I want to do is I want to break this down. Because all of us are far from perfect in our obedience, let's see if we can narrow some of these commands down a bit. The first thing that I would say is that there are commands that we are commanded to do in the scripture. The second category would be that there are things that we're commanded not to do. And then beyond that, there are specific tasks that individuals or groups of people or churches are given that they are to do or not to do as given and directed by the Lord. And again, I know those are three broad categories, and we could all say that we're failing to some degree in, in, in all of those categories. So what I want to do is narrow it down even further and say that we need to stay close to what the author has given us in the book of Jonah so that we're not stretching his point farther than it should. So here we see Jonah, a man who is refusing to obey God, and not just a failure to obey, as we all do, but a refusal to obey. This is deliberate, rebellious refusal to obey God's clear command to us. So now the question would be, is, are you willfully refusing to do something God has commanded? Perhaps like honor your father and mother, and you're saying no to that. Or, or loving your enemies, and you're saying no to that. Or, or, or doing good to everyone, especially the household of God, or being a witness in this world about why you trust in Christ. Those are things that we're supposed to do, and yet sometimes we deliberately not do them. Another way we could say this is that there are things we are, we are commanded not to do, which is things to avoid. And we think, well, we still want to do that. So there might be things like, um, like taking the Lord's name in vain, where we know we shouldn't, and yet we do. Or perhaps we are sexually immoral and we're sleeping with our girlfriend or we're having an affair. Those are things we're told not to do, and yet sometimes they still happen. And, or, or maybe it's do not provoke your children to anger. You know you're not supposed to, and yet you do them. Or maybe it's a specific task that God has called you to do. Perhaps it's, it's something like increasing your giving to the church for the mission of God. He's calling you to be generous in your giving. Or maybe you're called to be a missionary and you're refusing that call like Jonah. Or, or not to marry that person or take that job or even purchase that item. See, all of this is meant to bring to mind something that in your life you may not be obedient to the Lord. And by doing so, I hope that you can imagine that we do this just as much as Jonah. 
We don't have to be quick to condemn Jonah. We just need to be as quickly to look at our own lives and see that we do the very same thing. And so as we've already set this up in the first three verses, the understanding of that the author's main point is that Jonah represents those who refuse to obey the word of the Lord when it comes to them. So now we're going to pick it up in verse 4 and see how the Lord responds to us when we do this. In verse 4, it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Now, I want to stop there for a moment, and I want to ask you this. Who brought this epic storm upon Jonah and these innocent sailors? It was the Lord. He's not, he's not, this isn't a mistake, nor is it a coincidence. This is sovereignty, and this is directly in response to the first three verses that we read. Jonah is disobedient just outright. He is fleeing from the presence of the Lord, and now here is the Lord's response. He sends a, hurls a storm at Jonah. And this is the same word that will be used when the, when the sailors are hurling their cargo off the ship and when they eventually hurl Jonah into the sea. And so verse 4 tells us the results of uh, God's actions here. The first thing he says in verse 4 is that there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So this storm began to grow. It became a storm, and it grew bigger and bigger. Now look at what else happens. It says the, the second thing was that the storm was so fierce that it, that it says the ship threatened to break up. And the author is actually adding the boat as a character in this story. Because literally in the Hebrew, it says that the ship was thinking or contemplating that it was about to be destroyed. Itself was thinking about itself. And so what we see here is that this storm is out of control, at least out of human control. And you keep in mind the first three verses, and we're to, we're to imagine that this is what God is doing to Jonah in his life because he is defiant against him. So we see here that Jonah is utterly abandoning the clear uh, command of God. He is, he is abandoning his prophetic call. He's abandoning his homeland. He's leaving town and getting as far away from God as he possibly can. And what we also see here is that God is pursuing Jonah seemingly with just as much effort as Jonah is putting into disobedience. Now, this is a sobering thought for us. What if, how do you feel about God pursuing you to draw you back using circumstances that you may not enjoy with the same effort that you are giving into being disobedient? It's, it's, it's a shocking thing to consider, and yet Jonah here is imagining this for us. Well, this divinely orchestrated storm is what drives the story forward to the end of chapter 1. And in here, we see that the storm is the center. What God is doing is central to what is happening here. If you jump down to verse 11, it says, The sea grew more and more tempestuous. So the storm is increasing. Then in verse 13, the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And then in verse 15, it says that the sea ceased from its raging. And all of this is meant to show that the storm is controlling. God is controlling the, the, the storm and the story as it goes forward. And the human actions throughout the storm must be read in view of what God is doing here. That he is accomplishing his good purpose and through his appointed instrument. Now verse 5 introduces us to the sailors on the ship that Jonah had boarded. And they're not named, so that doesn't mean... That is what we need to know. It says that when the ship was about to be wrecked, completely shipwrecked, that the mariners were afraid. That's verse 5. It's unlikely that these men were fearful of just any storm. They've been through storms before. They've do, gone through a hundred storms, perhaps. So they're not fearful just for anything, just, not just for a big wind or even a storm in general. But when we come to verse 5 and how we normally judge how worried we should be by looking to the experts, it says there that the mariners were afraid. And verse 5, that is our first clue. The second clue is that they, they were so afraid that they thought they were outmatched. Their skills of sailing were outmatched, and this storm was greater than they could imagine. So now they're crying out to their gods, and they are looking after or looking for supernatural help. 
And then it says, as they shouted their prayers, they were giving up hope, and they started to hurl the cargo off of the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. And the cargo here represents their livelihood. This was their business. This was them trying to, to make a living. This is what they always did. And yet here they're throwing, they're hurling everything off as fast as they can because that has become more important, their survival themselves. So lightening the boat would have raised the boat on top of the water. It would have allowed less water would have crashed in as every wave broke against the boat. Now the sailors were fighting for their lives. They were above deck and they were doing, they were scrambling. They were going all over the place. But then verse 5 says this, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. This is supposed to catch us off guard a bit. We're supposed to see and ask the question of how can anyone sleep in such a storm that's going on? Their lives were at stake, and here Jonah is asleep. He's probably rolling back and forth from wall to wall as the waves uh, leapt and landed every single time. And yet here we see that he's not just sleeping. He is in a deep sleep. This is the same sort of sleep that was used of Saul and his soldiers when not one of them knew or heard that David had come into their camp and taken some of the king's items. The other thing is that this is used of Abraham when the Lord shows up as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch when he makes a covenant with him. It's also the same deep sleep that is used of Adam when God performs rib surgery on him to create Eve. And so this is a, a sleep that at minimum shows us that people are unresponsive to the physical surroundings that they are in. And so I think at the same time, Jonah is in a deep sleep here, totally unresponsive to what is happening around him. And what I, what I, what I think the author wants us to notice, what I think he wants us to be thinking about is how Jonah is completely disinterested in God, in God's mission to the Gentiles, and he wants nothing to do with it. So much so that here he is sleeping, unresponsive, to the Gentiles and the people around him that are crying out for help to be saved. And until Jonah will actually go and share, just like with the Ninevites, share the loving kindness of God in, in giving them hope for a forgiving God, a gracious God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that he would call them and show them the answer to their life-saving cries. Until Jonah does that, he will not fulfill God's purpose for him. This is what he's called to. And these are people around him that God desires to save and loves very much. But will Jonah step up here? But before we get to that, I want to ask you a question. The question is this, just like Jonah, how different is the church today? Believers individually and even corporately together are commanded by Jesus Christ himself to go and make disciples of all nations. So is Strathmore Alliance doing this? Are we obeying, submitting ourselves to the word of the Lord? Are we living set apart for God? Are we declaring lovingly the truth and love of Jesus Christ to this world? Or are you, as an individual, obeying the word of the Lord? Are you living a holy life just as God has called you to, just as God is holy? And are you testifying to all kinds of people the, the, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, even to those you might call Ninevites in your own thinking? Or are we enamored with ourselves? Are we only focusing on ourselves, those who are, who are like us, and we're actually distancing ourselves, like Jonah here, from those that we don't like or we don't want to even see saved? This is a challenging question. We, are we asleep while the world around us is perishing? Shockingly, the Hebrew doesn't assume that Jonah was actually asleep before the storm. It's possible to read it in such a way that when the storm started, that is when Jonah goes to sleep. He, he leaves. He goes down to the passenger's quarters, and he just wants to, for this to be over. He, he just sleeps through it the entire time. And more important than that is the author's way of showing us what's happening in Jonah's life. It says there in verse 
5, that he went down into the inner part of the ship. But this isn't the first time we've seen this downward descent by the author. It started in verse 3, where it says he went down to Joppa. Joppa is lower topographically compared to the hill country of Israel. Then he's in Joppa, and it says he went down onto the boat. So now he's at sea level. He just continues to go down. Here in verse 5, it says that he has gone down into the inner part of the ship and very likely lower than the water level. And then in chapter 2, after he's thrown into the sea, he will descend to the lowest possible place on the planet where it was believed that by Jonah and others that this is where the gates of hell actually were located, the realm of the dead. And so what we're to see here, the author is impressing upon us how running from the Almighty is always a downward spiral to death. And therefore, our refusal to obey the Lord, the word of the Lord, when we don't obey, no matter how difficult it might seem to us, no matter how dangerous it might seem to us, to us, no matter how despicable it might seem for us to do something that the Lord has commanded us to do, we must obey or we will be leading ourselves in the pathway to perish. Even if you immediately benefit from some joy or some peace or some happiness because you didn't obey the Lord, apart from Him, it is entirely temporary. And we see this in the Word again and again from all sorts of characters beginning with Adam. And Adam shows us that rebelling against our Creator's commands will lead to death. And it says in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. That's what Adam was told. That's what Adam received. And that's what all sinners will end up getting. And it also says in Romans 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. And because every one of us is a sinner, every one of us has fallen short, we all have the wrath of God remaining upon us, just like Adam. And yet, this is why Christ came to save us, to come and to earn the righteousness that we lack, and to earn the forgiveness that we so desperately need. So that by the, the one man's disobedience, this is Romans again, by his disobedience in Adam, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And so when we look at Christ, and we, we see his comprehensive, substitutionary, sinless, saving work, it is salvation for all those who will receive him and what he has done for you by faith, who will submit themselves to God, and who will obey his word. And it's here that we come to John chapter 3, which says, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever believes in him, has eternal life. And what does that mean to believe? It also implies that he obeys, that you obey God. You submit yourself to him so that, on the other hand, whoever does not obey Jesus shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So the God of the Bible here that we see is angry against sin. We, we see this in the storm. He does not want Jonah to sin. No matter how big or how small we think it is, sin always has ugly consequences. It is a rebellion against God himself. But here we also see that he's offering grace to all of us in the Bible through what Christ has done in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. The question today then is, are you running to God or are you running away from God? Do you obey him? Do you submit to him? Or are you refusing to do so in your own life today? See, those of you who are presently refusing to submit to the Lord and the word that he has given to us, to heed what he has called us to, we are on the way downward spiraling to death. And this is a call now to realize this and to repent. If we repent, and that means doing a complete U-turn, that we would turn away from sin and turn to God, those are opposites. You can't live for both. You've got to die to yourself and sin and live for God. And if you'll do that, you will receive the forgiveness of sins, which was paid for in the precious blood of Christ on the cross. 
and you will receive the perfect uh, purchased righteousness for you. And we know that this is true through the resurrection that God raised him from the dead, which was God accepting his sacrifice on our behalf. So repent for your sin and rely on Jesus Christ today before the Lord comes in judgment. And here we see him coming after the one he knows where, where he is, what he's doing. He even knows the affections of our hearts. So he knows when we are hypocrites. He knows when we're lying, when we're just thinking that, oh, I said some confession and that's it. He knows. He reads our hearts like books. And so if you will turn to Christ today, you can be forgiven, saved for eternity and in the faithful hands of our Heavenly Father. And if that's you, I encourage you to reach out to a Christian friend that you know today. Or even email me with the email address I left below in the video description. And, and I'd love to talk about this with you, to answer questions that you might have or whatever it might be. But listen to what the Lord is speaking to you today. Now, this question of whether you're running to God or running from God is not just a question for those who are not part of the church. Jonah is in the people of Israel, just like we are in the people of God. And so this question is for believers as well. Even we must persevere until the end by drawing near to Christ and abiding in Him. The Bible teaches us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it also says that apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you're a Christian who, who is like Jonah, and you are continually going down, descending into deep sleep towards God and towards His Word, you just don't care. You're unresponsive to it anymore. If you're a Christian like that, the Lord wants to wake you up today. And if, for Jonah, he uses the captain of the ship to do it. Look at verse 6. He says, it says, The captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Why are you sleeping? How can you sleep? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. So the captain and the crew have tried everything. They've tried to manage this storm, and they just can't. They know that this is out of their control. Nothing was, was working, and it was only getting worse. So whether you were a mariner or not on that ship, you were to cry out, call out to your God for help. And when the captain realizes that there was a passenger on board who was somehow sleeping, he immediately wakes him up. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 6. The same word that came to Jonah in verse 2 is what the, the captain speaks, perhaps on behalf of God. He says, arise and call out. And this jars Jonah back to reality. And he now sees the, the, the big mess that his disobedience has caused in his life. The Lord has brought about this incredible storm against Jonah to get Jonah's attention. He is, his very life at this point is at stake, and, and he doesn't want to submit. He doesn't want to obey. So God is out there getting his attention. And this storm continues to rage more severe as time goes on, as the distance he travels away from the Lord, and as he tries to uh, refuse this call the farther he goes. And its effects have now spilled into the lives of those around Jonah. All of this is a result of his hardened heart toward God, toward what God wants to do in his life and, and, and reach out to the Ninevites, reach out to the world and call people to himself. Jonah wanted nothing to do it, so his heart was hard towards God. It can all be over this storm, everything, if he'll surrender himself and start walking in obedience to him. And you know, God greatly desires your willingness, your willing heart. He doesn't want to force you to love him, but he's not afraid to change the circumstances in your life so that you will cry out to him. He's trying to draw you to himself, and he'll make your life in such a way that he will bring you back and you will want to be back and realize the reality of your rebellion. There's foolishness in running from God. We see this in Jonah. Do we see it in our own lives? And we see that perhaps we need to stop here and look at what Jonah is going to do. How will he respond? 
What is he going to do now that he's awakened to this reality? We don't know. We're going to look at that next week, what does happen. But we've got some soul searching to do this week. Perhaps it is that, that God is intensely pursuing you today. He is jealous over the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us, and yet we are out there committing adultery with the world. He, he loves us, and this is why he's coming after us. He wants us, whatever is best for us, and whether we like it or not, the best thing for us is to find our ultimate satisfaction in the creator and the heavenly father of, of us, of his church. And so we need to see what kind of father he is. He's so attentive to his children that he knows everything that's going on in their lives, what they're thinking in their hearts and their minds. He, he's faithful and will keep us faithful until the end because of the covenant that he has made with the blood of Christ. But also, he is not afraid to discipline us in such a way that he would bring storms, even hurl storms into our lives so that we will recognize the foolishness of our decisions. We know that all of us at various times choose to deliberately disobey God and what we know is right. We all do this. And sin always has ugly consequences. But to those who purposely persist in their sin, they know full well what they're doing and yet they continue in it. Whether that means that you are unfaithful to your spouse and you continue to be so. Or, or you're bullying some other people just to get your own way. Or perhaps you lie a lot just to get out of trouble or, or to smooth things out. Or maybe you demean leadership because you just don't see eye to eye and think you can always do a better job. Or, or maybe you're dismissing God's call on our lives to go and to love our enemies, to make disciples of all kinds of people, even those you might even call your Ninevites. And so what we need to see here is that even though we do this with full knowledge of God's clear command, we rebel against him, we will continue to descend further and further towards death. And our lives, so much, we've gone down so much that our circumstances can resemble Jonah's. And we are unresponsive. If we fall asleep towards God, we are unresponsive to his discipline, and we will not, we will not have the, the life that he has called us to, the life he wants to give to us now and for eternity. And so what I want to say is what one commentator said. He says, he imagines Jonah sleeping. And he says, sinners are sleeping with only a plank between them and eternity. And the call to them is, awake, you sleeper. What I want to do just to end now is I want us to, to, to look at the book of Hebrews. It talks about how Christians, these are people in the church, might turn away from what they know in Christ. And, and this, I think, is so helpful for us today. It says in Hebrews 3, Brothers and sisters, exhort one another every day that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And we know that sin comes into our lives and we love it and we want it and yet we know that it is not for us. It is not good for us. And we don't actually want to go down that road, and yet we do. So it says, exhort one another every day that none of you may be hardened by the, the, the deceitfulness of sin. And I want to lend your, your ears to the caution that Hebrews also gives elsewhere. It says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed, and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience, 
and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It is the loving and mercy and, and, and grace of God that he would cry out to you, whatever the means, even as far as going as far as he did in Jonah's life, to cry out to you, awake, O oh sleeper. So may God awaken us all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need words like this more often than we normally receive them. To be awakened to reality, and not just with our eyes, but by faith knowing what it is that you are doing and what it is that our relationship to you matters eternally. And I pray that there would be people out there today who are awakening by the power of your Holy Spirit, working in their hearts and their minds, showing them the reality of their rebellion. And all of us, at one point, have all been in Adam, and yet we need to be in Christ for then our forgiveness is earned and our righteousness is secure. So, Father, I pray that there would be people today who are understanding this message and by your Spirit are turning themselves to you. They're turning away from their sin and submitting themselves to you and your word. But I also pray, Father, that you would reach out to your children, those you've been pursuing and coming after, so that they would turn back to you. I pray that you would help them to repent and confess, for only by your Spirit can we do this work, but also that they would submit themselves to you and seek to honor you by obeying your word, what to do, what not to do, and the things that you are calling them to do. Forgive us, Father, for our, our obedience is so imperfect, and yet by your grace we can be saved and forgiven. So I pray that this would fall on ears that are not deaf, but that are open, and the soil has been prepared by you, to receive it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.